On behalf of the Institute for Policy Studies, I wanna welcome everybody who's joined us online and who will be seeing us later on. It's an extraordinary opportunity for us at IPS to have two longtime friends of IPS, Michael Tiger and Jamie Raskin with us. We've been doing a number of these book events, book launches, book discussions, conversations. And this one is all of those. Michael's, Michael <clears throat> Tiger's new book has just been published, Sensing Injustice, A Lawyer's Life in the Battle for Change. I highly recommend it. We're gonna put in the chat how you can order it, but it's basically at Monthly Review Press. And I wanna just briefly introduce our two guests who will have this conversation, who I think need little introduction, but will be there anyway. Michael Tiger's legacy in, in the movement for social change as a movement lawyer goes back more than 50 years. We were just talking about the National Lawyers Guild 50 years ago and what it looked like then. Among other things, he won the case in the Supreme Court that led to the release of thousands of Vietnam era uh, war resistors. Uh, he represented a host of movement activists and intellectuals from Angela Davis to the Chicago Eight to the Black Panther Party, David Trung, a host of others. And his ties to IPS also go back a very long way. Michael was one of the key attorneys in the legal team that investigated and won the crucial legal judgment against uh, the Pinochet dictatorship in Chile that held them responsible for the 1976 assassination in Washington in 1976 of our colleagues, Orlando Letelier and Ronnie Moffat. And at the time, of course, they also began the work and Michael was part of the legal team that worked continuously to hold Pinochet responsible, accountable for torture and for genocide. Uh, and so that kind of international human rights law has also been an area of, for decades, that Michael Tiger has played a huge role in and kept him connected, of course, to IPS as well. Joining Michael in this discussion of his book, his memoir, his work in the movement uh, as a people's lawyer, our own Jamie Raskin, the Democratic Congressman from, uh, from, from Maryland and from specifically part of the areas right here around Washington, DC. Also a former professor at the at American University Law School. Uh, Jamie, one of the leading constitutional scholars at the time teaching, and now one of the leading constitutional scholars in the Congress, in the role of which, of course, he played a key role leading the second impeachment uh, of Donald Trump. And he's played continuously key roles since he's been in Congress in the Congressional Progressive Caucus in representing uh, the, the interests of democracy and the, and the constitution against the continuing assaults that it has faced. And we have, of course, our other, our other IPS connections to Jamie through all those years. Jamie at the time of the assassinations was a young kid in Washington with his coming in with his father, with Mark Raskin uh, at that time when, when Michael was around IPS, so they go back a long time through that, the horrors of that period and through all of the fight backs since that time. So it's an amazing opportunity for all of us to hear them. Just a couple of housekeeping details and then I'm gonna turn it over to the two of them. Um, about, we're gonna have Jamie and Michael talk with each other for the next half hour or so. After that, uh, I will be uh, coming back on with some of your questions Again, in the Q&A part, not, don't use the, the chat for that, but in the Q&A, if you have questions, we'll be able to take some of them for additional conversations. And then Jamie and Michael will each have a few minutes to wrap up and I'll come back just a few minutes before five o'clock to say goodbye and thanks, and we will close out at five. So that's what we are looking forward to. And now I'd like to bring on officially, since they've already been chatting with each other because they can't resist, Michael Tiger and Jamie Raskin, thank you both so much for being with us here today. Phyllis, thank you so much. Uh, it's a great delight to be with you, with the IPS community and with uh, the great Michael Tiger. I thought I would waste literally no time on an introduction because an hour with Michael Tiger itself is nothing more than um, uh, a thin introduction to his remarkable body of work as a lawyer, as a scholar, as an advocate, and as a political actor. So I thought I would just launch right in with a bunch of questions I wrote down as I read his remarkable book, which is around 500 pages. Um, let me start with this, uh, Mike. Uh, everybody uh, compares you to the Clarence Darrow 
and to the, calls you the Clarence Darrow of our time. Um, is it a fair comparison uh, either to you or to Clarence Darrow? Uh, and tell us what you think about that. Well, you know, I, when I was 13 or so, I said, told my dad that I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. And he gave me the Irving Stone biography of Clarence Darrow and said, this, you got to be a lawyer like this. He's for the people. And I read everything that I could find about Clarence Darrow. And I wouldn't dare to compare myself to, to Darrow in any sense. I will say this, that his, his understanding of history, his analysis of the his, historical events and placing the cases that he tried into the context of the history of progressive movements, what made him unequaled as an advocate. And so if you're going to do this work that we're talking about today, you would do well to emulate him. And I also want to add a footnote. You can find at Santa Clara Law School um, that a few years ago, they retried Clarence Darrow, who, as you know, had been tried for bribery. And I represented Darrow. I played the part of Earl Rogers. And I read the whole 90 volumes of the trial of Clarence Darrow and the accusations against him. And I just want to say that uh, if you can send me a letter, I'll expand on it. Uh, he didn't do it. Uh, that there is no stain on his career in that connection. So, you know, I'll, I'll, he, yes, I'll take he's, it. He's not just not guilty. He actually didn't do it. Um, yes, exactly right. Yes, but we we and we understand the difference. This was a put up job uh -huh. by a, a coalition of the the Pinkertons, the investigators, funded by uh, major bankers a part of the political process in California. And it was a completely trumped up charge based on uh, the perjurious testimony, principally of a guy named Bert Franklin. And well, of course, you know, you, you have had your own run-ins and encounters with the establishment and you've always stood strong. Uh, you've left a number of institutions. And of course, you were famously forced out of uh, your clerkship on the Supreme Court. Tell us that story and tell us why you think it's important uh, to stand up for your values against the establishment if it comes down on you. Well, at the end of my second year in law school, I got a letter from Justice Brennan asking me to be his law clerk. And I said, yes. Well, that triggered a right-wing backlash based on my having been a sort of activist at Berkeley as a student. And a member of the Committee on Un-American Activities put something in the congressional record. James Kilpatrick of the Richmond News later wrote something. And then, it, so in June of my third year, I get a call. Brennan wants to talk to you. And I tell the story in a book. It's also told in Steve Wormiel's biography of the justice. I went back to Washington, where I'd never been before, and I met Justice Brennan. And I said, look, I will tell you anything you want to know about me or my politics, but, but I'm not going to tell the world about this because I, I think it's a matter of principle. And if that's cost me the job, it cost me the job. But I, I remind you, sir, that my position is the same as you took in your confirmation hearing uh, when Senator McCarthy questioned you. At that point, he said, listen, could I remind you, I'm a justice of the Supreme Court and you're not. Uh, so, you know, whatever. But so I went home and wrote out the story of my politics. And Brendan said, oh, you're my clerk. Well, I get to Washington finally, and he revokes the offer. I hear later that there was pressure on him from Abe Fortas, from Ramsey Clark, and from Chief Justice Warren. Uh, Brennan came into chambers uh, one day and said to his clerks, the chief told me to fire Tiger, because Warren thought that that would, you know, that, that the controversy might help get Ronald Reagan get elected to be governor of California, which by the way was gonna happen unless Ronald Reagan was caught with a chicken in a motel room. Uh, but there you are. So I was out. I got a job with Williams and Connolly, then Williams and Wadden, and started doing what I'm doing, did the draft case. And then in 1977, I exchanged correspondence with Brennan, and he asked me to come and have lunch with him. And we talked. And we met several times over the ensuing years. Um, it, and finally, he sent me a picture of, of himself inscribed to Michael Tiger, whose tireless striving for justice stretches his arms towards perfection. And then a little later, a letter saying that, yes, he had overreacted and concluding 
with something like, the only way I've been able to live with myself is that we've become good friends. Shortly before the library at Georgetown Law was to be dedicated to Edward Bennett Williams, Brennan asked me to come to Washington and help him write the dedicatory speech he was to make. And we went over Ed Williams' arguments to the Supreme Court. Brennan started by saying, I'm going to talk about these. Seven of his 13 appearances were for the Catholic Church. He was wrong every time. I'm not going to mention that. Um, and so we healed it. And on the way out of his chambers that day, he took my arm in his hands and he said, did I do any good up here? And, um, and I said, yes. Uh, so it was a story and it was a, you know, it was a part of the process of growing up and, and an introduction to Washington, DC. It's an extraordinary story. It's well told in the book. Uh, I should just say parenthetically, there's a question in the chat uh, just about something you said, Ronald Reagan was not caught with a chicken in a hotel room uh, and he went on to become elected governor, right? Um, yes. But um, look, one of the points you make along the way is if you're gonna be a progressive lawyer in the bar, you've gotta be a better lawyer. You've gotta know more, you've gotta be more erudite you've got to research harder, you've got to write better briefs, your motions have got to be tighter, your arguments have to be more compelling. Um, and it's a, it's a powerful point and a, a great uh, object lesson for progressives who want to go into the law. I wonder what your career advice is these days to young people who are progressives. Do you think that law is still a good path for pro some progressive people to go into, or do you warn them away from it because of the the right wing court packing that's taken place? Well, the answer is yes. It is a good profession to go into. And first, you know, at the time I went to law school, there were a number of people who rejected the idea of the law. The law is bullshit. I didn't go that path. I wanted to be first in my class. I wanted to study. Uh, the process by which the law is shaped and changed by the activities of people. And so I tell the story in the book, from my first year onwards, I tried to do that. Um, second, I learned quickly that we were not going to win the battles that were then pending in the courts by having judges define things for us. Already on February 1st, 1960s, six years after Brown v. Board, students in Greensboro, North Carolina had said, we're not getting anywhere. And so the direct action movement began, which all of a sudden changed the stakes and dramatically changed the jobs that lawyers were doing, because now we had to get people out of jail and represent them and talk to juries about this. We had to be very, very good lawyers, as you pointed out, of a different kind. And that's the other part. I walked into the offices of Edward Bennett Williams, who offered me a job a half hour after I left. Why he did, I never know. But I was mentored by one of the great lawyers of the 20th century, who not only could try the hell out of a case, but whose Supreme Court and other appellate arguments were masterpieces. We talk, I don't know what I'm talking about. We talk about national security. Ed was arguing Ivanov versus United States, a wiretap case involving a Russian. And Justice Ireland said, well, Mr. Williams, I remind you that if you win this case, a spy will go free. And without a, missing a beat, Ed said, well, I would remind the court that espionage has the lowest recidivism rate of any federal felony. And, um, and then he went on to make his point about that, that, the need to obey the Constitution. But that brilliant bit of advocacy illustrates uh, the, the Ed Williams I knew. Yeah. You've been associated with so many huge cases. I mean, I can imagine uh, not just a movie, but a, a whole series of movies being made. But let's just take a, a couple of them. The Chicago 7 case, the Angela Davis case, uh, and let's take the case of... Uh, that you worked with people at IPS on in terms of uh, chasing down the, mm -hmm. the murderers of Orlando Letelier and Ronnie Carmen well, Moffat. But in those cases, do you define with your client 
the ends of the objectives of the case in legal terms, in political terms, in moral terms? How do you go about thinking about it? And, and what about if you have a client who says, I don't care whether I win or lose, I just want to make a point and let's go make a point. How do you relate to those kinds of clients? The fundamental decisions about the representation and the nature of it are the clients. That's the first question. And a lot of lawyers don't understand that. And that means to the exclusion of any desire the lawyer may have for self-aggrandizement. I have participated in a hearing, as a matter of fact, at the DC Board of Professional Responsibility about that very point. It's the client. The client is the center of this. That's what client-centered advocacy is. And some clients would, would you know, they'd like to, to win based on what the legal rules are. Now, the second point is that litigation, like book writing and like being a member of the Congress, is a team sport. So I don't want anybody to think that I sort of did this all by myself. Um, the, uh, and so in each one of these cases, we had, we had decisions to make. Uh, that's my mother-in-law's telephone. I'm sure that it'll be taken care of in a minute. Um, so let's see, you had three that you wanted Chicago to mention. Chicago 7, Angela Davis, and then the- Right, uh, no, okay, right. Chicago 7, Chicago, Angela Davis, and then let's tell you, Chicago 7, I was a volunteer. I wrote the pretrial motions, most of them, and went to Chicago and argued them in front of Julius Hoffman. Uh, the government also claimed for the first time that they could conduct national security electronic surveillance without a warrant. So we litigated that in that case unsuccessfully, but I continued to litigate that issue in case after case, as I tell in the book. So, you know, the Chicago, I was not going to be a trial lawyer in the Chicago case, but I was, as a relatively young lawyer, somebody responsible for making sure that the record was protected. And, um, you know, I tell in the story the fact that Judge Hoffman issued an arrest warrant. I spent a got to spend a day in jail with Bobby Seale in the federal lockup, which is a great thing. Uh, the Angela Davis case, similarly, Angela had been my colleague at UCLA, and I was asked to write the pre-trial motions in her case uh, because this was a classic instance in which the government um, wanted to substitute this feeling of collective culpability based on Angela's politics for a finding of real guilt about a crime that she did not in fact commit or have meaningful participation in. So that was, that was exciting. It was exciting to be asked. It was exciting to argue those points. Uh, and you can find all of the records of it. But the Letelier case is, that's, that's the one that, you, that teaches us a lesson. Because on September the 21st, 1976, the bomb goes off. I get a call from IPS. The FBI is going to investigate IPS for the killing, as though they had anything to do with it. I got to a meeting with the then Attorney General. Sam Buffone and I looked up the law, saw Landau help to research it, John Dingus did, and we, the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act of 1976 gave us an opportunity to sue the Republic of Chile for this. And we did, and we got a judgment. Well, the Chileans said they weren't going to pay it. But IPS got together and began working the Hill. And legislation was passed, and you remember it, that said no joint military exercises with Chile until they pay. And eventually a mechanism was found whereby they did pay. And so that weakened the hand of the pro Pinochet forces in Chile. And then comes 1998. Suddenly a lawyer in Spain, Juan Garces, gets a criminal case against Pinochet under universal jurisdiction and Spanish victims and gets, there's an Interpol warrant and Pinochet's arrested in London. And I read about it in the paper, but I just arrived at Washington College of Law, the, the place on Massachusetts Avenue where we used to office. And I get a phone call and the phone call says, hello, uh, I'm, I'm actually a barrister from London and I've been briefed by the treasury solicitor to uh, handle the extradition of this fellow Pinochet. And, uh, you know, I know extradition law, but this immunity thing is quite something I have dealt with. Do you suppose you could pop over here and, and talk to me about it? And so Jane Tiger, uh, my law partner and life partner, and a couple of WCL students that Dean Grossman permitted to go, we went over and we worked with these barristers and worked on this question of 
immunity, impunity, you know? And indeed the House of Lords decided that Pinochet was criminally liable for much of what he'd done under principles of international law. The magistrate decided he was extraditable and then the Blair government chickened out and they let him go back to Chile. But in the meantime, he'd been weakened because he was, his invincibility had been pierced. The final chapter with an IPS hick to it is that one of Michael Vernon Townley's victims, Townley's the guy that killed Orlando and Ronnie, right? The agent, was another of his victims was Carmelo Soria, a Spanish diplomat in Santiago, because we found out from the Chilean ministry that Townley had killed 12, perhaps more people. And Soria's widow, Laura Gonzalez Vega, wanted Townley extradited from the United States, where he's still being protected by the CIA and other intelligence agencies, back to Chile to stand trial. And I remember we go to a single justice of the Chilean Supreme Court who explains to us that, no, 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 Pinochet managed to pass an amnesty for murder. So you can't extradite Townley back to Chile because he's been amnestied by Pinochet's legislation. Well, WCL students and Jane and I went downstairs to the coffee shop and started reading the Chilean penal code. And do you know there's a provision in there for something called illicit association, which is membership in an organization, the purpose of which is to commit crimes. It's not a conspiracy statute. So the students helped Carmelo Soria's lawyer draft a statement saying, well, there was an illicit association, Pinochet secret police, and there's no amnesty for that listed in the amnesty. And five years ago, the Chilean Supreme Court holds unanimously that indeed the entire Pinochet secret police apparatus is an illicit association. And that opens the door to prosecution. It's a, I'm sorry to go on. So the, the arc of that process uh, is, tells a story. It's a it's remarkable, remarkable story. And it's just one of dozens of stories like that in the book. Let me ask you a couple more questions before we're going to open it up. Um, you know, even the greatest Michael Tiger fans in the world had some questions about your representation of uh, Terry Nichols and uh, Timothy McVeigh about the Oklahoma bombing and especially the very dramatic moment uh, during uh, the death penalty phase of the trial where I think you, you know, wrapped your arm or your arms around Terry Nichols and said, this is my brother. Um, what, what motivated you to take that case? Uh, okay. do you, do, and do mm -hmm. you still think you made the right decision when you did? Okay, first of all, no wrapping of arms, never left the lecture, but let's go. A uh, couple of days after the bombing occurred, I got a call from the chief judge of the West United States District Court for the Western District of Oklahoma. He had been, it had been recommended that he call me by Judge Patrick Higginbotham of the Fifth Circuit, quite frankly. And also there was other, he had also seen some video of some mock summation I did. And he said he wanted to appoint me to represent Terry Nichols because McVeigh already had counsel. I'm gonna to speak to all the lawyers out there. I knew that if I said yes to that, that was gonna be three years perhaps out of my life. And uh, that we were going to face a lot of difficulty. But it seemed to me that having been chair of the ABA litigation section, 60,000 members, having trumpeted the obligation of lawyers, that I didn't have a choice. I had to accept that appointment. Um, maybe it's a little bit like deciding to run for Congress and standing up for principles in the public forum. Um, you could, one could be out there making a lot more money and, and, and drawing a lot less controversy, but there it is. And so then I reached out to Ron Woods, Ronald G. Woods, who I had known, uh, he's from Texas. He'd been US attorney for the Southern District. We had represented Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison together because she was yeah. a University of Texas graduate. And, uh, you know, and I did it because the Dean asked us to. Senator Hutchison is the only member of the Senate with a piece of paper signed by 12 jurors that said she's not guilty. The other 99, you have to take their word for it. Um, and uh, so with Ron Woods and I putting together a team, we 
put together then a team of other lawyers, including Jane Tiger, Adam Thirschwell, we had paralegals, investigators, and we tried that case. Yeah. And the jurors acquitted Terry of use of a weapon of mass destruction. They acquitted him of arson. They acquitted him of first degree murder, acquitted him of second degree murder. And um, the judge nonetheless held that he was death eligible. Well, I mean, we all are, but I mean, in the sense that he could be tried for a death penalty. Uh, and indeed I was rebuked by the prosecutor for saying, this is my brother. And you may remember from the summation, I answered that criticism in summing up in the penalty phase. I said, you know, there's a story of Joseph who was left to die by his brothers, goes to Egypt and becomes a great man in the house of Pharaoh. And then his brothers eventually come before him for an alleged theft. And um, he announces himself, for I am Joseph, your brother. And for all the rest of the book of Genesis, the brothers can't figure out why this guy didn't have them execute. Um, but the story, that's a story about forgiveness. That's a story about redemption. And I was able to, working together, to tell that story to a jury. And when it was remarkable advocacy, and it was a powerful statement against the death penalty. All right, let me just ask you about one more, because we're just scratching the surface here. But I discovered, you know, you were a hero in so many places. I didn't even know you were taking cases. For example, the one that jumped out at me was the Deborah Meeks case, um, who was uh, in the, the military and was charged with sodomy for living with another woman. Tell us about what yes. happened and what you did a there. A consensual sexual relationship with a civilian woman off base was the charge. And that's the military code, sodomy. It's court martial. Yes, it's, it's in the court, it was a general court martial. I mean, she was a major with 23 years of service. Um, and the evidence that, that sexual conduct had actually taken, the sodomy had actually taken place was thin as could be. This is the Clinton administration. They let the case go forward, despite don't ask, don't tell. And so there we are in a little courtroom in San Antonio trying a general court martial. Well, Debbie was acquitted by the court. And one of the things that I think that members of the court got hold of was, wait a minute, this statute makes it a felony, it means no kissing below the belt, even if you're married to the person, even if it's of a different gender. The military judge had rejected our, you know, unequal application argument. So I think there was an understanding that this distinguished serving officer was being prosecuted. Uh, based on the com base commander's, uh, you know, personal set of preferences. And uh, I'm, I tell the story at, at greater length in the book, but it was pretty interesting to talk to that jury about the responsibility of the officers serving as the court in a court martial to see to it that a distinguished serving member of their profession got a fair trial. Yeah, and that, that wasn't your first encounter with the military, of course, because you created this selective service reporter and articulated a whole strategy for defending draft resistors during the Vietnam War. Why don't you tell that story and then Phyllis, maybe we should go to questions because I could go all day with my- Well, family. this is 1967. The number of draft cases is going up. Kids are refusing induction, resisting the draft in other ways. There had to be a book written that showed people how to counsel young men about the draft. And by the way, that was my first contact with Richard Falk because he was instrumental in seeing that Princeton was gonna give draft counseling, make draft counseling available to those students. My second was then when I started writing about challenging the legality of the Vietnam War. But we, a group of us published the Selective Service Law Reporter I wrote the book, The Practice Manual. Um, and again, I want to give a shout out. That means I was at Williams and Connolly at that time. And I went to Edward Bennett Williams. I said, I got to leave. I got to, I wanted to write this book and do this. He said, well, uh, how much are they paying you? And I told him, he said, all right, look, if you just take a phone call from me once in a while, uh, come by the office, just when you have a chance, 
I will make up the difference between what they pay you and what you've been getting at this law firm, um, which meant that my family didn't have to suffer for it. Wow. All right, so, Phyllis, I, I think I, I will turn the floor over to you. You're going to call on people or should I? I am. I'm, I have a couple of questions I'm going to take from the some people are writing in the chat. We told you not to, but you're doing it anyway. Boy, we can't even count on our own audience here. Use the Q&A, but from the chat. Um, a very interesting question for, for Michael, of course, saying, my main reservation with these extraordinary and admirable tales is that, quote, justice comes long after it's politically and organizationally relevant. Assassination, imprisonment, or whatever state sanction might be used has its purpose in slowing, halting, intimidating popular action. It succeeds and then is punished far later. What do you think? And I want to bring in another question because they're linked. This was a question I had in my head and my colleague Sarah Anderson just put it uh, in the Q&A also, which has to do with the question of the relationship between movements and trials, between activists and defendants. How, how does that relationship emerge? When you talked, Michael, about the role of the primacy of the role of the client making in making the decisions and determining what they want out of the trial. But how does that also fit with the movement within which political trials occur? The role of supporters outside, people in the courtroom, the support committees that get formed sometimes all over the world. How do those things fit together? And how do you make sure that the client is able to do the political work they need and want to make their case something bigger than just about them? but something about a whole movement? I answer first with, a, with a, an idea, and that is that lawyers and law decisions do not stand at the center of all the events by which the world is moved. Um, what's, what's is at the center of the events by which the world is moved is movements for change, people in the streets, activism of all kinds, that, that it gets dramatic enough that courts are compelled to recognize what's going on in hundreds of different ways. That was true of the civil rights direct action movement. It was true of the, in, the great movement against the Vietnam War. And I suggest to you it's also true of the Black Lives Matter movement, which I can get to in a minute. And so the, the task is defined by the movement for change. We listen. Now it's true that it often takes years for the, to vindicate someone who is the victim of these injustices. The United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit just released a man named Ronnie Long, who spent 44 years in prison for crimes he did not commit. But let me go back to something that I have more personal connection with. I went to South Africa in 1987, 1988, and I saw the guns and the dogs and so forth and so on. And I sat down with one of Nelson Mandela's lawyers who said, you know, we're gonna bring this country to a halt over the summer with all kinds of demonstrations. And Mandela is coming out. And I said, well, I, I don't really, you know, how, how are you gonna do that? He said, well, we are because we got the power. Two thirds of the people in this country are people of color, even more. And there it is. And as Albie Sachs said, when he came back from exile, all revolutions are impossible till they happen, then they become inevitable. So think of the lawyers in South Africa, think of the people of South Africa, who from the early 1950s until Mandela's release, dealt with, resisted this system in any way they could. And then one fine day, Mandela walks out of prison. So uh, we're talking in periods of historical time. And our job as lawyers is just is not to change things, not to be arrogantly believed that, oh, we'll get a judicial decision that'll make it all better. That's not happening. Um, it's our decision to do what we can. We are not obliged and are not expected to complete the work, but neither are we entitled to abandon it. I think that's probably the only thing of Thomas Merton's I can remember, and I probably didn't say it very well. I think Thomas Merton would think that you said it quite well, actually. So thank you for that. A question from your old partner, Sam Buffone, you have seen some dark days of American democracy. You have also lost cases in front of the Supreme Court on issues we would think were obviously wrongly decided today. Are you worried that the courts are becoming politicized and society is more polarized or are we forgetting the difficulties we have overcome in the past? 
It's an interesting. Wow. Well, uh, it's true that that. Well, actually, I've never lost a case, but I have come in second a couple of times. Um, <laughs> and uh, but uh, it's interesting because one of the cases that I lost was a case called Johnson versus Texas. And Texas executed young Dorsey Johnson, despite our claim that he should have had mitigation evidence uh, about youthful age. Right? Then several years later, Rob Owen, the brilliant Robert Owen, who had coached me through the Johnson argument, comes back and argues a case called Franklin. And Justice Kennedy then gets it, changes his mind, and puts things back on track. Um, we didn't know what was going to happen with the Good Connect case, the draft resistor case you referred to, but the Supreme Court decided it unanimously. So I don't hold out tremendous hope for the present court because I think at least two of the justices lack the fundamental honesty that ought to go with having the job. Um, and I won't say any more than that about that. You can figure out who I'm talking about. Uh, but I have been surprised by the way that justices for about whom we knew little turned out to be important players in this process of justice seeking. Justice Souter is the biggest example, best example I can think of right off the top of my head, because he, after an undistinguished first term, he came around and participated in some truly monumental decisions about important issues. And his interrogation, his questioning of lawyers in the court was so precise and wonderful. Uh, so, you know, we um, one of the things we've got to do is understand that we, we're going to lose, we're going to come in second in these cases from time to time. There's and a shout a, out to Sam, by the way. If that's the Sam Buffon came upon the question, that's Sam Jr. It's Sam Jr. Uh, it's exactly Sam Jr. Who was a, um, who, who's a great lawyer. In his own right, absolutely. There's a related question from my colleague at IPS, Karen Dolan, and she says, I wonder if Michael has any reflections on today as a notable day in the legal system. Julius Jones' death sentence was commuted. The men falsely accused of killing Malcolm X were exonerated. The trials of the killing of Ahmed Aubrey and Rittenhouse's murder trial are reaching their peaks. It seems to be quite a day for legal commentary, she notes. And it's, it well, isn't a set of things. I, I, it would be yes, wonderful to hear your yes, perspective. Yes. First, first, if you read the decision in Long v. Hook, Long v. Hooks, the support circuit decision I mentioned earlier, you'll see the dissenting judge, a Trump uh, appointee, saying, well, it's not really our role to do these cases. Uh, the, these exonerations are indeed fundamental to a decent legal system that pays attention to the duty of judges and lawyers to confront, address, and remedy errors committed by the ex executive power. So that's true. Now, I don't know how the case pending in Georgia is going to go, but let's go back to the one in Minneapolis, Shaman. In the Amado Diallo case in New York, the off police officers were acquitted. In the Rodney King beating case in, in Simi Valley, the officers were acquitted. They were acquitted because the jurors bought into the BS that the police always put out there about the way they need to behave in the streets. The jurors in the, in the Floyd case did not buy into that. And I, I think it's important to recognize that the movement for change, the Black Lives Movement, helped to create a sense in the community at large that we need to be skeptical about claims that the police are exercising their power in permissible ways. Uh, so, you know, uh, yeah, we can look at some of these judges and say, gee, they're not probably not going to do a very good job. But the fact is that Finley Peter Dunn might have had it right. The Supreme Court reads the election returns. Whether that's exactly right or not, uh, the movement for change has a job to do and has in the past uh, helped to push things in, in the legal uh, community and in the courts that would not otherwise have happened. And indeed, that's the theme of the whole book. The theme of the whole book is, hey, you know what? You can sense injustice. You can see it. And when you see it, do something about it. This is work that anybody can do. That's the book is designed as a series of stories about that. 
Well, here's a question that raises the issue of what those stories mean. This comes from Scott Armstrong, who says, what keeps you going in the face of the absurd contemporary political environment in which such a large percentage of voting citizens believe demonstrably falsehoods and ignore attacks on the constitution and attacks on the law? I, I came to a sort of beginning of political awareness in the 1950s when huge numbers of citizens behaved, believed in absolute BS about something called the great communist threat, when millions of other citizens held attitudes about people that are of different colors than themselves that were just harmful and nutty. Right? So um, my good friend Scott, this is not the first time, right? And it, didn't somebody say don't mourn organize? Uh, and as to the question of what keeps me going, well, look, I'm I'm 80 years old, and thank goodness it's a team sport. Thank goodness there are people coming along behind, like, uh, let's see, this fellow Jamie Raskin, for example, or the law students whose lives Jamie and his colleagues touched with the Brennan Marshall program at Washington College of Law. Because I have the sense, and I do give talks at, at Washington College of Law and Duke, I have the sense that this generation of law students coming up, that many of these folks are ready to uh, accept the obligation to carry on. Um, Phyllis, if I can jump back in for one second. Absolutely. Thank you for those uh, kind thoughts. I want to ask you something about law schools, legal academia, and scholarship. One of the things that impressed me the most about reading about your career in kind of this comprehensive way was the, the way in which you would come to a case, not just from the standpoint of the particular facts of this case and the objectives of the client, but also reevaluating and redefining the whole rule of law. And you would come upon a legal doctrine, a legal phrase, a legal concept, um, an apparently settled legal notion. And you would say something seems off about that to me. And you would go back decades or centuries or millennia in order to discover kind of the roots of the concept and then completely rewrite the whole field. And I'm wondering um, uh, what you think generally about the state of legal scholarship, a lot of which uh, seems to glance off of the legal and political struggles that you've been involved in and that seem to be more self-reflective or meditative um, or not so involved in the nitty gritty as you've been? Uh, so, you mean solipsistic, self-referential? Uh, <laughs> yes, boring, na I would nasty, say nasty, brutish and long. <laughs> um, but uh, yes. But that's, I mean, folks want to write about that. That's fine. They want to do that. I don't, you know, that's okay. But the fundamental point you're making is the point that is the motivator of significant legal change. I didn't invent the idea of going back centuries in order to find things and bring them forward. It was Lord Edward Cook who said in 1608, uh, from the old fields must come the new corn. And what he meant was we must go back to Magna Carta, and particularly Article 39, Chapter 39 of Magna Carta, and there could be no more eloquent statement about the obligation of judges to confront exclusive executive power than what he said in 1608. God said me never to live under the law of conveniency or discretion, for if the soldier and the justice sit on the same bench, the trumpet will not let the crier speak in Westminster Hall. And again, in 1610, in the case of proclamations, the king hath no power whatever, except as is recognized by the common law. So what you said in that impeachment really reached back to the oldest tradition of American constitutional law. And indeed it was, and if you doubt me, read the most recent decision of the United Kingdom Supreme Court pointing out that the Queen's orders in council are judicially reviewable and relying on case law familiar to those who wrote the Constitution. Um, so for the legal scholars out there, if you don't believe me, read Sir Stephen Sedley's Oxford uh, 
lectures, the book, collected a book, Lions Under the Throne. And um, you'll see that Jamie and I are right. Let me jump in with one last question for you, Michael, and then I'm gonna turn it back over to both of you for some closing thoughts. And this comes to the question of international law. Um, you, you, ref you referred earlier to Richard Falk and some of the work that he's done on international law representing Palestinian rights and others. In general, it seems that international law, even more than some of the best parts of legal systems in this country or anywhere else, does not have a way of being self-enforcing, that it takes political movements, sometimes governmental action, to enforce international law. When you went after Pinochet, when you went after Chile for the assassinations and for torture and genocide, mm -hmm. how did you see how that would work in terms of whatever the decisions were of the judges, how would it happen that Pinochet would actually be taken to jail? I mean, it turned out he died before he could be taken to jail, but he was under house right. arrest. That was something when he died. But how well, does that connection that, happen? It, you know, fellas, it, it ain't hard. But if it wasn't hard then. Sure, we had the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, so we could sue Chile. That's what the statute said. The mandarins of international law in Washington, D.C. didn't think that, but the statute or text did, we won. Um, you know, the fundamental idea that nation states and leaders of nation states are responsible for crimes against humanity, torture, and genocide was fundamental to the Charter of London and therefore to the Nuremberg Tribunal. And what all we were doing is carrying forward the fundamental ideas that were expressed at Nuremberg. Then those ideas begin to be accepted. 1964, finally, France puts the crime against humanity into its penal code and says that, that no statute of limitations for that, right? The, 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 the claims on by leur nature imprescriptible. That is, they're not subject to prescription or statute of limitation. And so they start prosecuting people, including Maurice Papon, finally, who had been secretary for Jewish questions in the Gironde. They finally prosecute him and sentence him to jail, even though he was de Gaulle's great friend. You know, his impunity is gone, right? So, um, so that happens. What the House of Lords decision, that happens, construing the torture convention. Now, the United States has taken care to try to exclude itself from the reach of these proscriptive provisions of international law, but their time is coming because if we look back at the Supreme Court, you know, it was during the Spanish-American War, the court held that principles of customary international law are part of the Constitution, laws, and treaties of the United States. And so we, um, we have our hopes. And... Um, we're continuing to do this work. And every single time we find some place where the principle is put into effect, we strengthen it, understand it better, and lay the basis for a new generation to pick it up and run. Thank you for that. Jamie, let me ask you for some final thoughts and then we'll let Michael close it out. Hey, uh, Phyllis, thanks so much for arranging this conversation. Um, Ever since I, I finished uh, Michael's book, I've been just so looking forward to talking to him about it. It's The book itself is a remarkable achievement, but it's just uh, a small reflection of the dazzling career that Michael has had, um, always throwing himself into a context where he senses injustice uh, and feels like he can make a difference in uh, confronting the situation and changing things. Um, and... Uh, you know, one of the things I love about the book is the way that the law itself comes alive, not as uh, a narrow and sterile discipline, but rather as one of the humanities. And he's always uh, constantly importing historical discussion, literary uh, discussion, discussion of politics, morality, and ethics. And so it's a, a really beautiful statement uh, about this remarkable career. And uh, Michael, I just want to thank you for writing the book and sharing with um, new generations of people all the struggles you've been through. Somebody who never burns out and doesn't complain about burning out, but always wakes up the next day and throws himself right back into it. So 
Uh, we're, we're blessed to have you and uh, Godspeed to you in your continuing journey. Well, Jamie, right back at you. I mean, I, I have, uh, it's, it's just remarkable of who you are and what you've done. Uh, and one interesting thing about this book, and, and I'll, I'll close with this. Uh, if you buy the uh, electronic edition, it actually, you can then go to the footnotes and so on. Uh, Jenna Waldman, who is a law student at Berkeley Law, put together these footnotes. And one of the things about doing this book that the internet, Wi-Fi and so on makes possible is that, that source material about these cases, these arguments and so on can be included and then links provided in, in the book so that folks can uh, read more about the story. But other than that, you know, I, uh, I only know one song and um, that song is, uh, you know, get, get, get on the bus, We're, it, it's going somewhere. And thank you, Phyllis Bennis for, for arranging this. Well, thank you all. This has been an extraordinary opportunity to hear from two quite extraordinary people. I love the fact that you both come to this with connections to IPS. I love the fact that we have the opportunity to talk with you both and to not just remember some of these extraordinary cases that you've worked on, Michael, some of the work on impeachment and constitution defense that, that you've done, Jamie, but making this link. So thank you both so much. I urge everybody to buy the book. The info on how to get to it at Monthly Review Press is in the chat. And thank you all for joining us today. And we're looking forward to more events in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Phyllis. Thanks, Eva. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Phyllis.